Thank you, Billy. Uh, in a sense, your introduction could have been my lecture. <laughs> so um, it will force, force me to introduce another caveat, which I did at the beginning of my first more formal talk. And this really is a set of notes. Um, and that caveat really is that there are two dimensions to trying to answer is Caribbean thought a useful category. The first one is a sociological historical dimension. And the first one is a, the second one is a close reading of texts in which we begin to look at, at people and to find commonalities, differences, whether there's a stream running through it or not. This is very much the introductory sociological historical exploration which, which feeds into um, the second part of the book, which would be um, the, the deep philosophical reading. So not much of that is here, and I hope it comes up in the questions. And I'm using you all today as essentially um, an initial bouncing board to begin thinking through some of these things which have been with me for a long time but never formulated in this way. So when Dilip asked, invited me here, I thought, why not use the, un the, the unwilling labor, unknown labor of the students and colleagues at WITS to um, test some basic ideas out on. I'm going to begin a slightly unorthodox way by reading a poem from Edward Kamau Brathwaite. Um, and it's from his very first book, Rites of Passage. And this is the very first edition of that book. And just for, 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 um, to prove that it is, that is, that is his signature right there. Right? The reason it does not have a spine is because I've read off the spine. <laughs> so it's called it's rites of passage and this is Calypso the stone had skidded arced and bloomed into islands Cuba and San Domingo Jamaica and Puerto Rico Grenada, Guadeloupe, Bonaire curved stone hissed into reef wave teeth fanged into clay white splash flashed into spray Bathsheba, Montego Bay bloom of the arcing summers Islands roared into green plantations, ruled by silver sugar cane. Sweet and sweat and profit, cutlass profit, islands ruled by sugar cane. And of course it was a wonderful time, a profitable, hospitable, well worth your time, when captains carried receipts for rices, letters, spices, wigs, opera glasses, swaggering asses, debtors, vices, pigs. Oh, it was a wonderful time, an elegant, benevolent, redolent time, and young Mrs. P's quick, irrelevant crime at four o'clock in the morning. But what a big black Sam, with the big splay toes and the shoe black, shiny skin. He carries bucketfuls of water, cause his ma's just had another daughter. And what of John with the European name, who went to school and dreamt of fame? His boss one day called him a fool. And the bus hadn't even been to school. Steel drum, steel drum, hit the hot calypso dancing. Hot rum, hot rum, who's going to stop this bacchanaling? For we glance the banjo, dance the limbo, grow up crops by maljo, have loose morals, gather corals, father or neighbor's quarrels. Perhaps when they come with their cameras and straw hats, sacred pink tourists from the frozen north, we should get down to those white beaches where if we don't wear breeches, it becomes an island dance, some people doing well, while others are catching hell. Oh, the boss gave our Johnny the sack, though we beg him, please, please to take him back. So the boy now migrating overseas. I use Calypso because I think it captures compactly the beauty juxtaposed to social ugliness, the creativity of the sea band, and ultimately the inability of people to survive. So the boy now negrating overseas. Of course, negrating is a play on Negro migrating, right. negrating overseas. Um, as I wrote in that little introduction, which some of you may have seen that Dilly posted, um, in 2004 in, at the University of the West Indies, Mona, myself, Tony Bogues, and Rupert Lewis um, Tony was at Brown, Rupert and myself were at Mona at, in Jamaica at the time, hosted a conference, the second in a series of conferences on Caribbean thought in honor of Stuart Hall. So when we invited Stuart, Stuart says, I, 
I, I'd love to come. Um, but why are you inviting me to a conference on Caribbean thought? And um, uh, we basically says, but well, you know, Stuart, you're you're Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> you're born not far from where we're sitting now, as we as we called on the phone. And um, he was <coughs> very um, touched by the invitation, but also <coughs> felt in 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 his very sort of humble way that maybe he didn't belong. I mean, he had been out of the Caribbean his entire life, and um, not back often. Uh, certainly not 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 in an, as an academic. So it led us to thinking, what is Caribbean thought? We knew Stuart was a Caribbean thinker, but we didn't know why he was a Caribbean thinker. Uh, for ten years, we hosted this series of conferences in which we we invited people. Not all of them were were born in the Caribbean. Um, for, for instance, Gordon K. Lewis, who frankly wrote some of the most penetrating books on the Caribbean, was born in Wales, of all places. Um, but among them were people like Sylvia Winter, George Lamming, Stuart Hall himself. And um, eight conferences were held in all, uh, and sorry, ten conferences were held in all, and eight books published. Uh, in the series on Caribbean thought, but I'm afraid that we never really answered that central question that animated us and that Stuart threw back at us in asking us, why is he a Caribbean thinker? More recently, um, in fact, this semester, which would have been in early February, while teaching the senior seminar in Africana Studies at Brown, a senior seminar for undergraduates, I reread along with the students Sylvia Winter's article which some of you may have seen, I don't know, how we mistook the map for the territory and re-imprisoned ourselves in our unbearable wrongness of being, of deceit. This is a classic Sylvia Winter title, which it, the title itself takes you a while to, first of all, read and then to understand. Uh, what struck me again, and we obviously can't go into the details of the article here, was the sheer audacity of Winter's project. Not only was it the beginning of her attempt to rewrite the history of the modern world, that is post-1492, but to upend the radical European-led ep epistemic structures that in various forms have endured for the past one and a half centuries. So she's turning Marx on his head. She's inverting him in many ways, or in some, in some respects, throwing him out the win window. So it, it, it led me to, to, to return to this question um, and it was a, about the time, I think, when Dilip um, was um, pestering me about an abstract, uh, two abstracts, not just one abstract, <laughs> two abstracts to give to him. I thought I could just arrive here um, flat-footed and um, wing it, so to speak, but no, he wanted abstracts. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I began to think about, I knew what my first paper was going to be, that, the one I did this morning. But I began to think about the content of this. And there were a number of things which immediately came up after reaching, reading Winter. It was Marcus Garvey and Garvey's project. And the sheer audacity of Garvey's project, uh, which tried to sweep together black people in the diaspora and Africa in one loop of organization to lift themselves out of the, of the disaster that befell Africa and the Caribbean um, from the contact with, uh, with Europe in 1492 and, uh, and even before <coughs> with the Portuguese and onwards. Um, I, I also saw it with the same. And then a number of names started to come to mind. James, Fidel Castro, Eric Williams, and his book Capitalism and Slavery. Uh, this feature of boldness and audacity then was clear to me, was not unique to winter. And it was, there's something there. And I, I thought of the song, um, Reggae Ambassador, from the classic reggae group Third World, written in 1989. Uh, this 1989 is, is, is the wake of what I call the great reggae insurgency which lasted through the 70s and into the early 80s, but by 89 had started to ebb. Um, but uh, in it, the lead singer, in, in the song Reg Reggae Ambassador, the lead singer, um, Bonnie Rocks, has a line, how can such a big, big song come from a little island? 
mm. right? And it struck me that that was a profound question, which actually touches on it, the heart of what I'm trying to understand. How can a big, big sound come from a little island? Let me start by saying that I'm not interested, interested in this out of some sort of what would be a misplaced national pride or hubris. I, I have absolutely no interest to, as Jamaicans would say, big up Jamaica or big up Trinidad and Tobago. Um, that is f as far from my interest as it could be, but I am distinctly concerned as someone from the region to understand what are the conditions under what, which this remarkable talent has been unleashed and also to be, begin mapping whether there is or is not a sort of central theme to its philosophical content. Bear with me for a few <coughs> minutes while I just list some names, okay? Um, in fact, Dilip started to do that earlier today, <laughs> right? But I'm going to be a little more extensive. This is why I asked you to bear with me. Some of these names will immediately jump out at you, and some you may not know. But this is a pantheon mm. of, of Caribbean thinkers. And many names are missing because I wrote this two mornings ago. I had, I had on my notes the pantheon, but I hadn't actually listed them. So I sat down and listed them. They're not necessarily in, in chronological order, whatever that means. Robert Love. J.J. Thomas, Jose Marti, Marcus Garvey, Amy J. Garvey, Otto Huiswood, Claude McKay, Wilfred, Wilfredo Lam, Fernando Ortiz, Eugene Chen, George Padmore, C.L.R. James, Una Marson, Amy Césaire, Suzanne Césaire, Jean Priest Mars, Claudia Jones, Franz Fano, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, George Lamy, Derek Walcott, W. Arthur Lewis, Fidel Castro, Nicholas Guillen, V. S. Naipaul, Roberto Retamar, Eric Williams, Patrick Chamoiseau, Edward Glisson, Juan Bosch, Sam Selvon, Lloyd Best, George Beckford, Orlando Patterson, Earl Lovelace, Norman Gervon, Elsa Govile, Stuart Hall, Michael Manley, Louise Bennett, Morris Bishop, Erna Bradbaugh, Lorna Goodison, Walter Rodney, Jamaica Kincaid, Edwidge Danticat, The Mighty Sparrow, Bob Marley, Lord Kitchener, Peter Tosh, Gil Scott Heron, Grandmaster Flash, The Great Big E, Dion Brand, Edward Kamal Brathwaite, Sylvia Winter, Shani Mutu, Sylvia Rodriguez, Marlon James, Sean Paul, Nicki Minaj, Rihanna. What I've done there is just list in, in terms of what came to my mind and some of the critical thinkers um, and leading um, people in the arts and writers of the Caribbean of the last century. It is a list full of holes. Um, obviously, everybody here deserves to be on this list. Perhaps you've never heard the name Eugene Chen. Eugene Chen is a, a Afro-Chinese Trinidadian who went back to China, but not back because a part of his heritage was in China, but not all of it, and became the secretary um, to Sun Yat-sen. So everything Sun Yat-sen wrote and did was because of Eugene Chen. Mm. Um, how uh, that happened, and uh, you know, this is just an instance of, a, of, of one case which is, is, is less well known. So uh, you know, we don't have to go into any more details. Um, I just wish to add to this list the Steel Band, Rumba, Calypso, Ska, Rocksteady, Reggae, Dancehall, Santeria, Obia, Voodoo, and Rastafari. I just wanted to add that as a sort of um, 
Philip of some of the, 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 the broader creative popular initi initiatives that have come from this, this region. Um, I won't talk about sports, which, which is entirely legitimate to include in this, in this agenda here. In fact, um, CLR James in his the original Beyond the Boundary established once and for all that it was part of this, the same discussion of popular culture. But it would take us all day to add a sports list to this particular list, so I've left it out. Remember, this is a small space, a small space. Um, in fact, Jamaica Kincaid's book, In a Small Space, speaks to this directly. Um, speaking of her island of Antigua, which, is, which has you know, 60,000 people, and you can you know, ride around it on a bicycle in a day. Uh, five million people in the Anglophone Caribbean, perhaps one million in the Francophone if you don't include Haiti. Eight million if Haiti is included in the Franc Francophone. Cuba, which I know is unrepresented on my list here. Um, Cuba is underrepresented on my list. Um, is an island of a mere 12 million people. St. Lucia, with two Nobel Prize winners, Derek Walcott and W. Arthur Lewis has a population of 130,000 people. Um, however, surprisingly, in my many years of engagement in Caribbean scholarship, I've seen few reflections on this question. That is the question of what is it peculiarly about the Caribbean that has made it what it is. C.L.R. James's um, conclusion from um, from Toussaint Louverture to Fidel Castro in the Black Jacobins, which is at the back of the 1963 edition, begins to excavate this territory, as does George Lamming in The Pleasures of Exile, um, which I referred to in the earlier lecture today. Gordon K. Lewis in The Growth of the Modern West Indies. There's a work on Plantation America by, by Ragatz. Harry Hotink's work on differentiating between the way race is deployed by Northern European versus Southern European colonies in the region is very important. Sidney Mintz's work is filled with references re related to this. Lloyd Bess and Carrie Levy's work on Plantation America. More recently, people like Aaron Kamogisha, who some of you know here, whose triple edited volume on Caribbean thought and culture um, begins to address some of these questions. Um, but still, the central question is not addressed frontally, I don't think. Um, I'm sure there are other books I could mention, but even those don't mention it frontally. Um, why no more work around Caribbean thinking itself? Um, perhaps the reason that there's so much work to be done on specific problems in the region, trying to understand race in itself, class, slavery, the nature of the colonial and the post-colonial state. Perhaps it's because the economic pressures and imperatives in the regional universities to produce practical work, work that has an impact on, on the, the national economy, work that, that changes the way we think about schools. These practical questions lead us away from the, the bigger issues of pulling back and thinking um, about what is this thing called Caribbean thought. Okay, so in, in drawing... Well, not quite to conclusion, but near to conclusion. I, I want to suggest a number of areas that I'm going to throw out there for us to consider. Um, and I've grouped together in, in, in a very um, unconventional way, causes and effects. I haven't, I haven't sorted out what is cause and what is effect here. But I just want to put down a number of ideas on the, on the table for us to think about. Uh, in, tr in trying to understand this question of, of what is it about this place that has generated this, ex this inordinate impact on, you want to say, post-colonial thought, anti-colonial thought as well, uh, certainly an impact way beyond its scale and place in the world. Um, I would say let's, let's begin to think about, firstly, the completeness of the colonial racial project with, with certainly on the islands elimination of the, of the indigenous people. And I use that carefully because there's a tiny movement now 
uh, in the Caribbean to reclaim the fact that titles haven't disappeared. And of course, they're running the genes of the people as well, because pe in um, a functioning, identifiable civilization, the Tainos and the, the Caribs are, are no more. There are elements of the Caribs in the Eastern Caribbean. So the completeness of the colonial racial project, the attempt to erase the past, the attempt to resurrect uh, a, a, a new um, colony built on purely for the purposes of exploitation, um, a sort of tabula rasa, is something that we need to consider and what that means in terms of, of what is formed. Uh, secondly, James, C.L.R. James's notion of the Caribbean as a peculiar product of modernity. And this is where you need to read as I've suggested, those who haven't read it yet, the black uh, Jacoba. Um, um, James speaks to the scale of deployment of labor in mass productions on the plantations. The sheer numbers of people employed in organized labor as exceeding any of the factories that existed in Europe at that time. So in a sense, uh, proletarian structures, proletarian methods of organization, were be of course with with, with with extreme exploitation of the worst possible kind, i.e. slavery, were being instituted in the Caribbean and therefore created a, a proletarian social space. Um, so so in a sense the Caribbean was implicated at the very earliest moments of of the formation of capital and of the modern moment and not at the fringes of it but at its very heart. And therefore, this has got to explain <coughs> the, engage, the engagement with modernity, the engagement with the dark side of modernity in its very origins down there in the sugar plantation. Thirdly, the ferocity of slavery in the Caribbean. Uh, one of the, 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 the features of the contemporary renaissance in historical literature on slavery um, associated with, in part, with the whole reparations movement and all of that, is that we're beginning to, to, to disaggregate in a more thorough way the practices of slavery in different venues. And one of the things that is coming out is, is, is the sheer ferocity of the Caribbean version of slavery. Um, you know, slavery was ferocious everywhere, don't get me wrong, but uh, it, in, in which the question of, of replacement was seldom, if ever, um, one of husbandry. And I have to use the words that the slave masters use, but simply working until death and then importing new people to replace the people who were there before. Thus, for instance, my country, Jamaica, um, is one of the largest places where slaves came to. In, in terms of the, the English-speaking market, something like 55% of all slaves came to Jamaica. I, I, I just want to be clear on that. 55% of all slaves who crossed the Atlantic on English ships came to Jamaica. Yet Jamaica, at the end of slavery, had a population of maybe 600,000 people. Today has a population only of under 3 million people. Um, what accounts for this disparity between the people who came there and the population which existed? that they were killed off in, in, in the process of, of producing sugar cane in massive numbers. So there's something about the strict ferocity and the death rates and the low fertility rates which generated a, a relationship to exploitation and an, an intimate understanding of the colonial enterprise, which is perhaps unmatched. And that is, that is something which is worth exploring. I'm suggesting it is an area worth thinking about. Um, however, I want to mention my A, A B, C, D, D, W, the fourth one. The psychology of majoritarian societies. Um, this applies both to slavery and it applies to post-slavery. And that is, there is a distinction <coughs> between a society in which slaves are a minority and one in which there is an overwhelming majority. When you are the overwhelming majority, 
there is a way in which the spaces to reclaim self are greater. A lot of these things I'm making in sort of, you know, half, not half-hearted, but half-baked ways in that they need to be thought through more thoroughly. But I'm, I'm going to suggest that an era for exploration is the difference between black slaves in the United States who are surrounded by not only white owners, but poor whites, right? And who therefore occupy a sort of place of super exploitation, but with all of these other whites around them, sort of encompassing them. And black slaves in a place like Jamaica, where 90% of the people are black, right? Who, who take back a part of their life, whether in the barracoons or on weekends, and claim a space for themselves in which they mock the whites and in which they're forced to do the work because the whip is there, but they create um, a space for themselves. I don't want to make an absolute claim for this, but this is something that I think is extraordinarily important um, um, when, when we think about, about the, the Jamaican, for example, early migration of the people of Garvey's generation to the United States when they encounter the American form of Jim Crowism, but they form their personalities in societies which are structured on race, but which are structured in a different way in which their sense of self is more assured. And so when they see the raw Jim Crow racism, they're not gonna have any of it. And so you have the, you have the Marcus Garvey's and you have the Claude McKay's who come um, from Jamaica and Nicaragua tremendous impact on the Harlem Renaissance and so on and so forth. So that's another area. So there, there's, there's if, if you want to use um, the term social capital, which is problematic, um, but the social capital which major, majoritarian societies generate is different from the social capital um, in societies in which, in which you are a repressed, you are, you are a racialized and repressed minority at the same time. Five, the peculiar politics of a small island. Smallness obviously can lead to parochialism and insularity. Um, it can also lead to a certain familiarity with everyone in the society. So there's a way in which you intimately know your oppressors, in which your oppressors are not strangers to you, in which your oppressors in deeply exploitative ways, but nonetheless mingle with you and have children in your space in, 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 in the crudest form in the slave state through, through um, rape, but also in post-slavery through illicit relations and so on and so forth. So there's an in intimacy which breeds contempt. And so um, there, there, there is no illusion of whiteness. Um, there is perhaps a fear of power, but there's a contempt which comes with intimacy, which is something that I want to, to exp explore. And further from that, the goldfish bowl is never so deep that you can't see and imagine yourself at the top in a small, in a small island. Uh, so so there, there's a lot to think about, about, about the, the, the psychology and the, the sociology, if you want, that a small state engenders and that therefore allows people to recapture a sense of self and power. I was discuss, discussing with Dilip the, the whole question. Um, we first met at Cambridge. Um, um, my, my wife was, uh, was Dilip's um, year of graduation and I was with my postdoc and um, we met many people from South Asia and be begun to understand the, what it means to, to qualify for a scholarship to get to Cambridge, assuming your parents are not very rich, right, Who are from South Asia, as opposed to what it means to qualify for a scholarship to get to Cambridge from Trinidad or Jamaica. Um, you're talking about a million people who you're competing with. You use the whole population. Of course, it's a much smaller cohort. But in, in India, you're competing with a billion people, right? 
uh, hypothetically speaking. Uh, it's not exactly that, but that coefficient, but we can get a sense of what of, of, of that. So there was a sense of the possibilities that you can do and what you can do in a small space. It's on the one hand parochial, it's on the one hand limitless. Right? So, mm -hmm. so the two things cohabit together. Um, you don't see the whole world, but the small world that you see has a definite surface, and I can get there. And this opens up the possibilities when that psychology is employed in, um, in a big place. It works in the same way. I can get there, because that's my psychology of being able to get there and not seeing the layers of, of um, separation between me and Tom. I also want to think of smallness specifically in relation to a juxtaposition of, of Greece, ancient Greece, that is, that Derek Walker does in his long poem, Omeros. And um, the way in which Walker teases out um, using the Odyssey and transposing it to the Caribbean a comparison between the peculiar culture, island culture, the um, archipelagic culture of Greece and the archipelagic culture of the Caribbean. And that it's worthwhile thinking through what that means because it's, it's always struck me that the thing that gave Greece its, its momentum, what made it special, was that there were all of these city-states basically staring down at each other seeing what the other one was doing, competing with them for um, whatever it means, trading and competing and, uh, and battling for space. And that this provided a kind of intense competition which drove um, the Greek city-states ahead. Of course, that simplified. There's a lot more to it um, and a lot uh, more back and front history that needs to be put on it. But I, I, I'm interested in that particular juxtaposition um, whether there are lessons to be learned from closely positioned islands in an archipelago and what that means if there's intimate knowledge circulating between them. It's a reach but worth exploring. I've, I've totally lost track of my numbering because I was using ones but I actually have A, B, C, D, E and F. So I'm going to shift to what I actually have. F. <laughs> the question of intimacy. Um, I've kind of made this point before, so, so yeah, it, it's really doubling up on the point, but there's a slightly different tilt to it, intimacy. The intimacy of the island, seeing and knowing the class and race that oppresses. Um, they are only one step removed. Um, and and there, there's a question of seeing through the veil, which, of course, W.E.B. Du Bois raises um, in, in black reconstruction, in souls of black folk and elsewhere, where black people have a double vision. They have the vision of um, everybody else, but they also have a way of seeing through white society, which white society in turn can't see through them um, because of their, their positioning in that society um, and so on. Um, Winter later on, Sylvia Winter takes this up um, um, in a different, slightly di with a slightly different accent. A, a way of seeing the world, of understanding racism, of un understanding how societies are hierarchically organized, and understanding them, which is which comes which is enhanced with the intimacy and the engagement of small societies. And finally, the question about to come back to the question about audacity, um, which of course is 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 one of my effects, not a cause. But audacity, I think, is the, the feature that is most striking um, about this, this phenomenon of the Caribbean. Um, the other day, I was looking on a Bob Marley interview that he did with some journalists in New Zealand. New, New Zealand is a place which really liked Bob Marley, which he had a huge impact on the society and, uh, and you know, the whole peculiarity of Maori culture and trying to find a place in, in this um, settler environment. And Bob Marley came and, as we would say, mash up the place, right? Um, 
But there was this interview in which Bob Marley is sitting down and the guy's talking to him in standard New Zealand English. Is there such a thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's talking to him in New Zealand. And Bob Marley is understanding him perfectly, but he's responding in Jamaican patois. Right? He's not compromising. He's just saying, I understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm going to give it back to you in my language, and you need to translate here. Not me, right? And there's an audacity in that. An absolute audacity, which, which, which resonates with some of the points I've been making earlier, and which I think is, is worthy of exploration. Now, all of these, are, are these qualities possessed by other people? Yes, certainly. I'm not making a case for, for, for the uniqueness. I'm making a case for um, this as a set of causative elements and some effects that have given these people mentioned above, that is, the, the, the list that I gave, and many beyond that, a very confident voice, and provided them with a sort of loose epistemic framework that has allowed them to make an inordinate influence on the modern world. Was this, was this a, 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 a temporal event that occurred at a, a juncture? Is it something that continues? These are all questions we need to answer. And of course, the bigger question which hasn't been answered here is what is it, right? And you know, whether or not we can prize out the peculiarities of a hall and of a winter, of a lamy, of a walk-up, and to see whether we begin to see common features. Uh, I suspect we're going to find that not all the features are common, but there are certain thematics associated with how one approaches the world which I think is, are worth further examination. So those, that's my initial foray into this question. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I think uh, it's, be, it's a very hospitable lecture in the sense that it's opened up uh, to us uh, the possibility of a discussion of a certain landscape, the landscape of Caribbean thought. And one of the things that uh, uh, Brian said about audacity is one of those things when growing up, you know, to see Gary Sobers hit six sixes in an over, right, playing in the English County League or watching Michael holding batter Brian Close, you know, ball after ball after ball, unplayable, and the balls come crashing into Brian Close's chest and so on. Then in the 80s, when the West Indies was the dominant uh, cricketing nation in the world, I remember even now on Channel 4 discussions where they brought in pseudo-experts with anatomical charts to show that the Caribbean body was more limber and more capable of delivering a faster <coughs> ball and so on and so forth. So there was an inability to understand where this audacity came from. Right? But there was an audacity and for a lot of us uh, watching the game, we saw that it was something more than a game. It was a politics that was being enacted. But that apart, I mean, what you've done in uh, this lecture is to lay uh, out a certain landscape, right? where you've spoken about the uh, the, the vicious forms of slavery, a certain form of labor organization, uh, the fact that the, uh, they were brought into a space, uh, a lot of the slaves that were brought into the Caribbean came into a space that was imagined as a tabula rasa. The Carib and the Caribbean had ceased to exist through a process of genocide. And so that's one thing that I want to ask you about. When we think about Caribbean thought, we have to imagine what existed before slavery. Right? How does that figure in Caribbean thought? Right? Because there is a fundamental violence that allows the possibility of slavery and the coming in of these enormous numbers of humans in very uh, extreme conditions subjected to cruel regimes of patriarchy, exploitation, and so on. But Prior to that, there had been a prior violence. How does that figure in Caribbean thought, right? Uh, the destruction of the indigenous. The second question is, the, what happens after the end of slavery? Right? Because in this discussion, indentured labor doesn't come in. 
Right, an indentured labor is another hidden form of slavery that comes in because with the declaration of the end of slavery, the whites still need people to work for them. So they bring in the Indians and the Chinese and so on. And you mentioned the Afro-Chinese person who then goes on to become secretary to Sun Yat-sen. These two ends of the argument. Right, so that's one question that I had. The other question uh, when you think about, so in that sense, uh, while you lay out the materiality of the origins of Caribbean thought, we haven't yet arrived at an answer to Stuart Hall's question. Right? What is Caribbean thought? What are the characteristics of Caribbean thought, if any? So I think we could probably discuss that more, because I think that's a question. Stuart Hall's puzzlement is actually central to this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, why call me? I realize you, know, you like my work, but what makes me Caribbean then? And so that question still exists, but there are probably ways of answering this also because if you think about the different relation to language, right? So if you think about Derek Walcott vs. Naipaul, right, who write and all of vs. Naipaul's early books, even though he was educated in Oxford, were written in Arbor, right? And effortlessly so. This is the way the Indians spoke. Publishers were slightly puzzled by this, saying, you, know, you went up to Oxford, so what's happened to your language? And he resisted <coughs> that. So when you look at House of Mr. Biswas, Inner Free State, Suffrage of Elvira, all of them are written in the language of the people. Now, this kind of audacity is something that in India we have been incapable of. So Indo Anglian writers do not write, they write good English. They're very careful to write good English. So you think about Amitabh Ghosh or even when you think about Salman Rushdie's experiments, they're of a certain kind. And he invents an Indian English, which is an object of humor. There is no way that Derek Walcott would condescend to the language that's spoken by the people. Right? So there is something about the relation of empire to India. India uh, British Empire is always deferential to the idea of civilization in India. You know, that they were entering a superior civilization, the early Orientalists actually translated from Sanskrit, works find their way to Europe and so on, but when the relation of coloniality to the Caribbean was one of an absolute dismissal. They had killed off the Car Caribs, then brought in slaves. So this enables a different kind of relation to the idea of language, apart from the majoritarian culture that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So Derek Walcott writes in our work, so does P.S. Naipaul. Yeah, which so also allows us to think about the histories of indenture and slavery, but that's another question that I raised earlier. <coughs> the other thing is that what does it mean to be the first human beings? Right? You know, if you think about this foundational history, the fact that these are people who have been brought from elsewhere, stripped off identity, stripped off their tribal identity, stripped off their religious identity. Of course, it's reformulated on the Caribbean, but they are the first, they are like the Adams and Eves, so to speak, on this place where fictitiously, or there is the myth that they are the first people there. Right? The, the Caribs have ceased to matter by the time slavery is introduced. So it's this island nation where the first inhabitants uh, produce this kind of work. So, I mean, there's just a set of thoughts that I'm putting out there. And but I still think we need to struggle with the idea of what does it mean to actually move beyond the list to enumerating whether there are any characteristics. Right? I mean, is there something called South African thought? Is there something called Indian thought? I would say no. Right? There might be Indian ways of thinking. Right? And this is the question that's come up in studies of African philosophy as well. Look, okay, Ubuntu is an African way of being. Now, how substantially that has worked out or how satisfactory the answers are another set of issues. But this idea of Africanness has been addressed in particular <coughs> ways. How would we address that in the case of the Caribbean? Is there a Caribbean way of thinking? Are there Caribbean uh, categories of thought and so on and so forth? That might be another set of questions, or that might not be the way yeah. we want to go. Yeah. Yeah. But I just want to put it out there. But uh, you can open it up for questions. See, what you want to make an initial response to you? Yeah, yeah if you like. No, no, I'd like to. I'd, I'd love to, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, the first thing is, yeah, it specifically has not gone, yet gone down that road, but it's, it's just, you know, rolling the pitch for, for, for the game to begin. Yeah. So this is rolling the pitch. This yeah. is establishing the sort of historical conditions under which these people emerged. Okay, so 
if these conditions make sense and the, 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 the pieces of it that have identified make sense in telling us something, then what does it tell us? Or does it tell us nothing? Yeah. You can have a pitch, find a road, and nobody comes to play cricket, right? But So this has been the rolling on the pitch, and, and to stimulate the idea that there may be something here worth playing and worth seeing. So absolutely, I, I, you know, we can begin that discussion today, if necessary. Um, the, the question of tabula rasa, I want to go back to the, the Haitian Revolution. And, and when Dessalines seized power and defeated the French, they called the country Haiti. Now, think about this. These are uneducated in the traditional Western sense, black people who 10 years ago were slaves. They've been fighting for 10 years. Never forget that. Um, they come to this place, and they're, they're sequestered on estates, and they're worked to death. And they become an army and fight the best army in the world and beat it. And then it comes a time to name their country. And they abandon Sandomag, which is the European name. And they name it, they name it the name of the country of the Taino, the Indians that inhabited it. Now, what is that? To me, it, it's, it's almost, you know, you, you know where, where, how did they know that? And why did they choose that name? For the people who were no more, or who were left in maybe about one or two places, they chose to name it. They chose to respect the, the, the people who were here before them. So there is a continuity and a sense <coughs> of that origin, original inhabitant and of his right to this place. And if he's no more, we'll at least give him the name of the place. A name is of, obviously of vital importance. I just want to throw that out there in response to the notion of, of the continuity with the indigenous. But there is a movement um, now in the Northern Caribbean in, in particular to reclaim the Taino. And, and there are actual people who say they are, they are Taino. <coughs> I wouldn't mean, doubt it, in, and, and more so in, in, in Hispaniola and Cuba than in Jamaica and in Puerto Rico as well. So, so there is that, but it is, it, is, it, is, it is a movement against generations which have said that there are no more Indians here. And so that, that's interesting. Um, the question of language, I'm glad you put it on the agenda because I think this is extraordinarily important. Um, you, you get people coming in from Akan people. And the Akan are actually very important because um, you know, the first slave um, shipments came um, from further up the coast and then it gradually goes down until it gets to Angola mm -hmm. in the end. So, 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 so the, the, the Wolof and the people further up and then, and then coming down, Akan and then Yoruba and Igbo and we're going down the coast of Africa. But the, the, the Akan had an extraordinary powerful impact in that in a place like Jamaica, um, they were militarily prepared, they played a role in rebellions, and they put their stamp on the people who came after. So there, there's something about the, the early people who established a, 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 a bridgehead, so their culture has a more, a more profound role to play in the subsequent integration of other cultures because of their fighting spirit, because of their presence, whatever it may be. So it's not just a matter of, of the reinvention of a Creole language out of nothing. It's, it's, it's the ordering of West African cultures and how they are incorporated. But more importantly, how in that incorporation there's a supreme act of invention which has to take place, of, of human invention, of really saying, guys, we need to speak to each other. We need to communicate, right? And um, there's one way of communicating. We can either speak like the Irish kind of English of the people who are oppressing us, because the Irish were very much the, um, the drivers. Or we can make our own language. And, 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 and so language is woven out of West African languages on the plantation. 
and um, the, the, the linguists are working on this tremendously. But, so it, but it's not woven in the abstract. There are dominant languages which then become sort of keystones for incorporation. And you have Jamaican. So Jamaican is not, Jamaican is, 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 is as different from English. A matter of fact, Jamaican, the linguists say, is more different from English. The German is from English. Okay? So use that as a marker. German, English, Jamaica. Right? German is closer to English than Jamaican is to English. Um, so that tells you the influence, influence of West Africa on the formation of this original language, which um, used to be called Patwa, but we prefer to call it Jamaica. Right? Um, so that's an exploration which is, which is worthwhile in also telling you why it is that if you meet a crowd of, if there was another Jamaican in this room, we would be switching, right? So I would be saying something half in English, and in the middle of it, something would happen, and I would just switch, and he would switch back, right? And we would be whipping all the way down, down here, and you guys would be confused. Because on the, on, 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 on the whip back, you would understand, and then the whip forward, then problem. So, I mean, this is not unique to Jamaican. You know, all languages in formation tend and uh, where, where they're incorporating more than one language. This happens, you would all know that from multi, coming from multilingual countries. But there's a peculiarity of it on, on, in, in, in the colonial context, in all colonial contexts, in that your language then becomes a secret language with which you can be in the same room as the person who is wielding the whip. And you can say, how do you ask that doing dosa? Right? When I'm still so, I'm ugly in a ras, right? And what I'm basically doing is cussing him from head to foot, right? And uh, but he doesn't know because um, you know if I'd said that in English, then it would be you know big trouble for me. But you know me and the other. But what did you say? <laughs> I said, what is really wrong with this dirty, stinking white man? Does he not know that he's the ugliest person in this room? That's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> <You're on camera. laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I am on camera. I am on camera. <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so that's on the question of of language, and um, finally on the question of indenture, because it's very important. Um, the question of indenture is is important throughout the Caribbean. It's not that, you know, in, in societies like Trinidad and Guyana, where the Indian population form roughly half or more than half of the population, it is of vital importance. But even in a place like Jamaica, there's a distinct Indian population which um, came in as indentures, indentured. And this needs to be incorporated in this analysis um, far more than it is at this moment. So I, I take your points fully. Um, but the, the, there, there is a question of commonality, um, and there's a question of difference. Um, the difference between indentureship and slavery, of course, is that the indentured people carried their culture with them, and this was accepted. They were supposed to be able to pay and go back, and many did pay and go back, but many could not and stayed. Um, but they, they kept their Hinduism, although it is frozen time, it doesn't evolve as, as it does on the subcontinent. Or, the, or, or their Islam, and so on and so forth. But um, there's so, so, the, so there's a question as to the, if you want to use the word creolization, which I, you know, is debated endlessly and is problematic. But and however you want to use it, there is an integration which takes place, which makes Naipaul. Um, in or, or, or the characters in House for Mr. Bezos, who they are, and who are un, unmistakably Caribbean, or West Indian, if you wish, unmistakably. They're Indian West Indian, but they're unmistakably West Indian. And um, so this, this, this pathway needs to be looked at, as we also need to look at the, the tensions between <coughs> the, the, the first colors and the late colors, which is the story of, of conflict between Afro Ghanese and Indo-Ghanese and Afro-Trinidadians and Indo-Trinidadians in particular. 
Um, so all of that story needs to be woven into how we understand the peculiarities of this of this region. So I'll leave that there for now. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I can't stay for longer, but I, I've got a, a burning concern. A absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've been working on Peter Abrams for a while. Yeah. Whom I consider a Caribbean thinker. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, you know, I mean, I mean, he was my friend. Oh, was he? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, I, oh, okay. That makes me feel quite moved. Um, anyway, um, <coughs> concerning Marcus Garvey, yeah. I'm a great man in my view, yeah. and, and what you touched on, um, on, on, on the question of audacity, yeah. Peter Abraham seems to think, in fact, that, I mean, when, when he arrived in, in, in London mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1940s, um, somehow, you know, by way of George Padmore and, and, and related people, you know, he seemed to develop some kind of disrespect for Gavin's way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And we know that Gavin was somewhat disrespected by his fellow intellectuals um, who thought of him as psychotic in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in so far as his ambitions are con were concerned. Right? Now, the book that he wrote in his 80s, Peter Abrams, mm -hmm. he seems to be reconciling um, himself with the idea that actually Gavi was really, really a great man, in the sense that he was not caught up with certain forms of European thinking, whether it's Marxism or, you know, or its opposites. Church, Church part more obviously is important in this regard. Right? And the question that he, he, he keeps raising is, how is Marcus Gavi possible? How is he? How is he possible? Yeah. yeah. SAP? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, right? yeah. I mean, there's something expansive and elastic, perhaps even more than the idea of Caribbean itself, yeah. as a man. Yeah. And I, I imagine President Henry will, say, will have something to say, yeah. and so far as ex existential way of thinking um, um, is concerned. So, I mean, this is one puzzling thing that I, 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 I want to kind of mm. take further and see perhaps what a human being is capable of doing. Um, over and above, you know, geographical kind of concerns. But, but having said that, wow, I mean, however deluded he might have been, you know, but Makas Gavi remains the greatest. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there, I mean, there's no, question, there's, no, there's, no, there's no question about it in my mind. And, you know, what puzzled people like W.B. Du Bois um, with Garvey, apart from the obvious um, jealousy, I think is a, is a human factor we can talk about in, in, in open company between the two of them, um, was, was that Garvey was not raised in the same sort of um, philosophical university context of, of Du Bois, you know, who was yeah, at Harvard and, um, you know, and so on. But Garvey is, so they, therefore Garvey had this notion of empire. And so, um, you know, people like Du Bois would be thinking that, you know, Garvey is going around in, um, in, in all the regalia of a, of a king, you know, and, um, they're, 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 that misses the point entirely as to what the context in which Garvey was embedded and what he was trying to do with, within that context. So I'm entirely sympathetic to Garvey um, and his project in the time it happened and in the context it happened. And uh, one has to be slightly touched in the head to try to accomplish what he did, you know? So um, um, you, you really have to have um, a sense of grandeur and of your own worth to, to think that you're going to weave together this massive movement, literally millions of people uh, across continents, and to, to attain a measure of success before it is eventually brought down by, by, um, by the United States as well as by um, you know, problems of organization and so on and so forth. But yes, Peter Abrams came to terms with Garvey, um, much as Jamaica as a whole um, reveres Garvey because of his, his audacity. 
and what he accomplished and how many people who were, you know, sort of wallowing in misery and in, you know, exploitation. He, he gave them a vision that they could be a great people. And there's nothing more than that when there's nothing else that allows people to rise up from, um, you know, the squalor of oppression. So, so his errors and his, his, his you know, the, the notion of, of, of just going to Africa and establishing a, you know, there, there, there are many things which don't make sense, but the big picture is what you need to hold on to and what he was trying to do. And to that extent, um, he was extraordinarily successful in, in, in giving people a vision of possibility in a world of impossibility. Yeah. I mean, so, uh, uh, Judge Padmore, I mean... Pad, Padmore, Padmore is one of my, my favorite people who is, when I consider people from the Caribbean who are underappreciated and understood. Because how does Padmore, who really comes from the same same community as CLR, James in Trinidad, and was James's friend. And when you hear Trinidadians with hard English names, like James and Padmore, Padmore was actually a nurse, an even harder name, English name. When I say hard, I mean typical English name, right? <laughs> um, these are Barbadian migrants to Trinidad. So James's family, nurse who becomes Padmore, are part of a Barbadian migration to Trinidad. The peculiarity of Barbados is that it was a, a training, it was more blacks were educated there. And uh, it was also the training ground for Caribbean police. So police would be sent out from Barbados to, and also for Latin teachers, which is similar to police. Anybody who teaches Latin <laughs> is like a policeman. At least then. The grammar Nazis. <laughs> the grammar, exactly. Grammar Nazis, exactly. Um, but I, I make that as a side point to show the commonality in their history. But how does Padmore end up in the common turn, running the Africa, Bu Africa Bureau? What is that? How does you know? How does that happen? And he does it, you know. And, and then and then when he realizes that that the common turn are really not all that interested in African freedom, he says to hell with you. My purpose here is is African freedom. And if you're not interested in it, then I'm going to go to London and find like-minded people like CLR James, like Kwame Nkrumah, like Jomo Kenyatta, and set up the African Bureau. And he does. Um, quite a remarkable man, and very much a part of, of, of this puzzle that I'm trying to figure out. If I may just uh, take you back to the question of categories and Caribbean way of thinking. When you think about the predominant Caribbean intellectual, and think about people like uh, Stuart Hall or Sri Rajin, they're very much within a Marxist tradition of yeah. writing. Yeah? So in that sense, uh, while they may have written about uh, certain issues which concerned questions of race, immigration, blackness, and so on, they adopted a paradigm of thinking <coughs> which presented itself as cosmopolitan and standing above yeah. all of this fragmentation. So what would it mean then to call them Caribbean, uh, Caribbean thinkers and to draw them back to a particularity which their adoption of a uh, theoretical position that aspired toward cosmopolitanism entailed? It's, it's an interesting question. Sylvia Winter. Yeah, Sylvia Winter. And, and, and that's, yeah. that's another She's feature. She's different. Yeah. different. But, but, but that's another feature of, 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 the, of the Caribbean in itself. Well, now we started to drill down to the questions of, of what this philosophy really is. Because it's like um, there's an eclecticism mm -hmm. which runs through the Caribbean. But it also runs through the sea lanes that run into the Caribbean. Every ship that arrives in port has sailors. Some of them who are, um, they could be from Norway, they could be from um, Ghana, um, they could be Caribbean sailors who, when it arrives in port, it arrives with sailors who have literature, occasionally. Not all, not all sailors are readers. There's literature. And so there's literature from the commenter, and there's literature from the UNIA. And this literature is, 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 is the material that people have to construct 
reality out of. And so there, there's an act of improvisation um, going on, um, which, which occurs with the other body of literature, which everybody has, which is the Holy Bible. Right? So the Holy Bible is one source of trying to make sense of this thing. So you have Rastafari, as, um, which uses the Holy Bible, reinterprets it, throws out what it wants, and sees Selassie as the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Right? And this, this serves the purpose of uh, a lot of intellectual work which goes beyond whether that's the case or not. Of course, which any religion is really concerned with whether it's the case or not. But the work it does, and what is the work that this does coming to the question of the Bible and, and, and Rastafari, is that it, it creates a black God, for one. And therefore, it inverts the racism in which there is a white God. Uh, it creates a black heaven, which is actually not up there in, in the stratosphere, but in the highlands of Ethiopia, right? Um, equally inaccessible, but nonetheless, it's in Africa. It, it, it inverts the negation of Africa into um, a positive reference to Africa. It looks at the denigration, and I use that word purposely, purposefully, because it's full of meaning, of black hair, and says, not only are we going to elevate black hair, but we're going to knot it up and make it into dreadlocks, right? And um, <coughs> so if you look at Rastafari, it's a pretty consistent attempt to crash the episteme of slavery and of colonialism. And to take a, and it fails in some respects, it fails in that it adheres to Old Testament patriarchy, for example. It didn't get that. But pretty much all of the other touch points it, it gets and, 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 and does immense damage to it. So, so that's, um, you know, Marxism, you know, many Rastas um, in the 1950s would have two flags on their house, shacks in Western Kingston. One was the red, green, and gold of Ethiopia, and the other was the hammer and sickle. And they saw no contradiction, because these were all forms of beating down Babylon, right? Yeah, Babylon being old, um, well, being, meta, uh, being um, hypothetical Babylon, but Babylon in the Bible. Babylon in Jamaica, Babylon in the world. Um, right. So, so there, there was no contradiction between the Hammond sickle and the red, green, and gold. They were all part of the struggle against Babylon. So there's, there's all of this eclectic sort of jazzification going on, mm -hmm. which is critically important in understanding um, grassroots theorizing as much as um, more intellectual, formal theorizing. Yeah, um, whew, this is amazing. I suppose we could do this for hours. <laughs> <laughs> I have um, two thoughts. The one is that the Dutch Caribbean is absent. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. and that's a, that's a pity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, and, you know, I know less than you do about the Dutch Caribbean, yeah. but I would be interested in thinking or finding out, you know, who the key scholars or key thinkers, you know, mm -hmm. um, from the Dutch Caribbean would be. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the one thing. Um, and also, of course, how the different colonial, the different the different imperial powers shaped these parts of the Caribbean differently, the Dutch, the Francophone, and the British. Mm -hmm. But the British and the Francophone seem to have been in far more conversation <coughs> than, the, than with the Dutch. Right? So that's the one point. The other thing I've, I've been thinking is, uh, given the <coughs> Given the condition of being the first people there who have to make a language and have to write them 
themselves onto the space and into the space in order to survive. Um, so there's that, but then, and there is a, and there are situated knowledges, right, that, that inform this making and this inscription of the space. And then the ships come with this literature, which is a different situated knowledge. And my sense is that, you know, if, if, if any human being were in that kind of context, your imagination would be on fire all the time. And that, for me, is what I, uh, yeah, I can't, or what I feel when I read um, Stuart Hall, Sylvia Winter, you know, I just feel like people's heads and brains have, and souls have just popped. Um, and what is interesting is that, you know, for me, the route, my route to um, that kind of emotional and intellectual engagement was thought from the Caribbean is through is through this peculiar place of the classified account, right? And and um, and constantly searching, which is the first question we can't ask asks in Caribbean discourse. Mm -hmm. Who am I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the point about the Dutch Caribbean and then the, the point about imagination and how all this, you know, the rich coming together of languages, of literatures, of situated knowledges, and of this uh, ferocious oppression. Um, you know, just creates imaginations that are really beautiful in all sorts of ways, creatively, intellectually, politically. Yeah. And of course, they all, I mean, what is so powerful for me is that the creative, the arts, is never separate from the intellectual. Yeah. If you think of Rex Metal yeah, 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 yeah. Right? And Sylvia Winter, they are constantly and it's an old, there's an old colonial education yeah. that also shapes this, which is not the silos of disciplines, you know, um, that people of my generation grew up with, yeah. uh, probably the people before my generation too. But you read, you, you did literature and physics, and it wasn't an issue. Mm -hmm. um. Let, let me just come in there quickly, if I might, um, on two things. First of all, the Dutch, a question, unquestionably. You know, I mean, the, the, there, there's a, a body of Dutch literature, um, the, the, certainly the political literature, people like Anton de Kamp, um, and a whole series of people. And you know, I can, you know, we, when we communicate, I'll send you some, some titles of work on the Dutch Caribbean. Remember, it all started down in Suriname. Right, um, um, the, 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 the Sur Suriname was where the, the first uh, sugar plantations really took off. Um, Barbados had some; it was not successful. They moved to Suriname, and um, so um, and, and there was a whole connection between Suriname and Rhode Island, where I live now, in which in which uh, the, you know the, move, the movements are all fascinating. So the Carolinas were a part of Barbados, North and South Carolina were intimately linked. And run from Barbados, so so you know the kinds of connections what we know about are, are all um, relatively new in comparison to the older connections. Um, so there's work to be done there in thinking that through. There's also a very important division, which actually is not quite your division, but a division between this the Hispanic Caribbean and the, the the North European Caribbean, which would include the Dutch, the French and the English, um, in, in the ways in which race emerges in the Hispanic Caribbean, 
is, re is defined in a different way. In, 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 the, in the North European Caribbean, there are three layers, white, brown, and black, white, mulatto, black. In, um, in the, in the um, Hispanic Caribbean, there, there are structures which um, Brazilians would be more familiar with, a sort of multi-structure there. Why is it like the top and black at the bottom? Never get, get away from that disparity. But there's a, all sorts of uh, Byzantine um, shadings and um, known generational connections, genealogical connections in between, which, which allows for a different kind of interaction between peoples. Um, which defines that not any less exploitative, but different. And um, Harry Houghting actually has tremendous work. He first starts to disaggregate this this reality and how it impacts upon people's lives and um, and, and the way the societies are formed. And for example, in um, in um, Puerto Rico and um, Cuba, there there did not develop a separate language. Um, you know, late Cuban slaves brought with them Yoruba and kept Yoruba, but did not develop a separate language in the way in which Jamaica developed its own language. And this is connected into the fact of the nature of how um, the colonial period evolved. So they speak Spanish, you know, um, Cuban Spanish, which most Castilian speakers can't understand, but it's still essentially Spanish, right? Whereas Jamaica is a separate language um, from English. Papiamento is a separate language, language uh, from Dutch, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, Papiamento is, is a classic instance of that, but also, so that's the same form. Mm -hmm. or, um, or, or Haitian Patois, which is um, a separate language from French. So um, to those points, let, you know, let us not overly romanticize this sort of bubbling, melting part of the Caribbean. There's the other side of it, uh, where you have hard um, positions that want to retain the status quo. That is why there, there's this fight, because there are people who benefit from um, the things as they are, right? The, the, the colonial order, the neo-colonial order, and who do everything possible, who hate um, the notion that Jamaica is considered a language to teach it is like anathema to them because this is a fall from grace um, and so on and so forth, rather than seeing it as a plus to know two languages, both English and this other one, and both being recognized. So there's all of that too. You, it's the imagination that allows for such a ferocious effect. Precisely, precisely. So, so it, it's, it's all that we speak about is a product of a fight yeah. and not just there, you know, like a, a Kalaloo soup bubbling happily along by itself. No, it's, it's a fight, it, and it, it remains a fight. Um, yeah, the, 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 the notion of, of, of the in-between group is also one that is constantly being questioned and battled in the Caribbean itself, because the in-between group was a group of privilege. It was a group of, it was a group of, of, of caste privilege. And therefore, there is a constant battle um, to maintain it, and a constant battle to negate it. And so, this this is part of the feature of the of the contemporary Caribbean. Um, but it's a battle that swings. For example, bleaching, which has become a major problem mm -hmm. in, in inner city communities in places like Jamaica, where people bleach their skin because a lighter skin could mean more jobs, or it could mean getting a man, or it, it, uh, it, it just remains something which some people value. This is in the country of Rastafari, you know? So, so the thing is complex. Thank you so much for, for the talk. It is really, again, the, the sense of having your brain exploding a little bit of creativity. That's what I'm feeling right now. So uh, I just wanted to ask you, um, you said at some point when you were talking about intimacy that, I don't know if I got it right, but you said there is no illusion of whiteness. And I just wanted to try to understand a little bit more this idea. I mean, I, I assume you were talking about race mixing, but I, I, I'm not sure. No, so no, 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 no. Well, I wasn't. 
I, oh. I, I was saying that people have what intimacy leads to is that you don't have an image of the whites as being superior, mm. right? Who is the ideal? Well, they may still be the ideal, but they are in, 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 a, in a peculiar, inverted, contradictory sense. Um, they are they are not they they are known. So treats saying, his wife badly. So you're um, saying that because of the intimacy that exists, yes. whiteness is no longer it, it, it's there is like an undermining of 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 what it it loses its mythical okay. quality. It loses. That's essentially mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. Okay. It's demystified, demythified, demystified, really. And therefore, um, and uh, that that's, comes from intimacy. Mm -hmm. You know the people. Right. Then you know that they're, they ain't all that. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and therefore, there's a, a peculiar two way relationship. Yet you still, I mean, where, where the bleaching comes in, to use that contemporary example as an example of what I'm saying. Yet people might still do that, and but they know that they're not all that, but they'll still be. So, how do you explain that? Mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure. But, yeah. but just to, uh, so yeah, thank you for the clarification. Um, I was also wondering because when you were going on like your points, mm -hmm. um, it was to me it was very evocative of Brazilian history as well. Yeah. A lot of the points that you that you were talking about. But then you had the point about what it means to talk from the small island space, yeah. and that is like the major difference yeah, where absolutely. like everything gets like. So, and again, I think I, turning the question around, I would ask what it means to talk about these major countries yeah. like Brazil or India or South Africa. Yeah. I mean, it's not really major in terms of geography. But in terms Scale. of the imag imagination of itself, yeah. like a country that is so big that it can afford the kind of insularity, because it, it, it kinds of you know like it, it thinks of itself as self self sufficient, yeah. even if it's not. I mean, but that's the imagination. And I'm wondering if speaking from the point of view of the small polity or of the small society requires a kind of lived transnationalism that shapes those experiences. Because that would be the case of other, I mean, thinking of the Lusophone context, that would be the case of places like Cape Verde or even Goa, mm -hmm. where the lived transnationalism, so not even like transnationalism as an academic exercise or as a political project, but the very fact that people live transnational lives yeah. because of the incapacity of the context to absorb all these people, they have to migrate. Yeah. So like, so, you know, I, so if you could... You, you've said it better than me. <laughs> I don't have to say anything else because I think you've made the point. And, uh, and, 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 and that feature of movement, of contact, uh, is not necessarily... I mean, you know, you mentioned Cape Verde, but think, think of Cape Town right. yeah. as a peculiar um, city which, mm -hmm. which, is, which operates like an island city mm -hmm. in, 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 in connecting with the Indian Ocean, with connecting mm -hmm. with the Atlantic. Um, you know, it, it's not by chance that one of the biggest um, UNIA branches that Garvey had was in Cape Town. Because Cape Town is a place where the ships come in and you get the documents and you learn about communism and you learn about um, whatever is, is, is on the market uh, that when you read it, sends a bell ringing that maybe this can help us in our own you know, context that we're in here. So, so that feature, um, and, and therefore the question of, and this is why I, I, I sort of said, an island can be insular, mm -hmm. but it can also be a place in which all sorts of international flows mm -hmm. are coming in and going out in ways which, and not just, by the way, boats. Think about when radio comes on the scene. Mm -hmm. what, is, what is reggae, for example? Reggae's origins, Obviously, I have Jamaican origins, but part, a big part of its origin is listening to New Orleans music. Not Miami music, Miami is, Miami is but New Orleans is a cultural center point, and the first AM radios are picking up Fats Domino playing, right? And they're, they're taking the beat, the blues beat, and putting a little more emphasis on the offbeat and coming up with something new, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, but so, so there are radio linkages as well. People in southern Cuba listen to reggae. So if you want to hear reggaeton, real reggaeton in Cuba, go to Santiago. Mm -hmm. Because they, they'll be playing reggae because they get um, the Jamaican radio stations better than stations out of Havana in um, Santiago de Cuba. So, so, and by the way, they play cricket in Santiago de Cuba. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so which is because a lot of the people there came um, from, from the Anglo Caribbean. It's only socialist country that plays cricket. Luca <laughs> <laughs> and then. Yes, thank you. So I was actually waiting for Lindy where to ask about the archipelago. I'm just yeah. kidding. <laughs> but because we over lunch, we've talked about yeah. this. So there's no small island conditions and archipelagos, and and you've also mentioned it in your when you were sort of giving your points. Um, more, I think, if I'm wrong or if I got it wrong in a sort of also sort of descriptive right way. I mean, the Caribbean is an archipelago geographically, as Greece was, and that sort of gives, you know, creates the conditions for, for example, you mentioned some sort of um, uh, in competition, you know, between the islands and sort of this uh, uh, push, right, towards, um, I guess, also sort of uh, reaching, you know, sort of pushing the limits of, but, um, so that I was thinking when we, what, when we take, so the archipelago uh, as a, um, as a not just as as a descriptive notion, but as a as a like a concept metaphor, right? For the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So first, of, first of all, like going back to your points, I was wondering if those were conceived, let's say, like on an island by island sort of basis, mm -hmm. or if they actually work archipelag in an archipelagic uh, way. La logically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, for example, because the archipelago, especially the Caribbean archipelago, is multilingual, right? Yeah. And uh, goes across different sort of imperial, um, yeah, right? So, for example, the question of intimacy, of familiarity, how that works when we think about Caribbean as an archipelago and not only as a, actually, archipelago, <laughs> as a group of islands that have like independent sort of trajectories, right? And this is part of one question. So again, linking also this with the multilingual sort of question that you were you raised at the beginning, but in a different way. But also then the question of archipelagic imagination, right? Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, the more than archipelagic sort of trajectories of the imagination because of the different sort of imperial formations that crisscross the islands. But at the same time, I was so amazed about you know the the the, the, man, the name that you mentioned that I didn't know, but I have it here. The Chinese um, Eugene Chen. Yes, but yes, ex which I noted down. I hope for the correct. My middle but... name Eugene was named after him. Ah. <laughs> Is it C H E N? C H E N. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I just. Yeah, I, I will look, look up on me. But also Wilfredo Lam, right, in, yes, in Cuba, yes. that also brings up to Japan somehow, although he's very much sort of Caribbean <laughs> thinker and actually artist. But um, um, So this is my very unarticulated question, I don't yeah. know. Um, at the same time, so I, for some reason, I, um, I was thinking about, uh, I don't know if you've read, if you're familiar with um, that work by uh, um, Fabien, I think Viala, the um, post-Columbus syndrome, um, uh, where she was, um, so she somehow was phrasing the the the, the argument that that there exists the uh, um, like a common archipelagic memory paradigm in Cari in the Caribbean mm -hmm. islands, and she um, and she analyzes how the the processes of remember remembrance uh, of the in 19, 1992, uh, after the, you know, the 500 from the, the... But at the same time, she says, while this common sort of archipelagic paradigm exists in the Caribbean, it does not translate in a um, shared uh, process of memory mm -hmm. in the... Because of the different works of cultural nationalism in the different islands, so somehow they make this common archipelagic paradigm, uh, memory paradigm, translate into different processes of memorialization, which again somehow, I don't know, it's, it's a mess of a question, but yeah. Um, how does it work? How does it, well, how does it work in, you know, again, thinking about yeah. also your set of sort of 
your points, the validity that they have on an island by island basis and and but what what happens when we think about, you know, in a sort of at the whole of archipelago, um, yeah. as a common sort of sphere of Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because uh, the presence of an archipelago doesn't uh, create an archipelagic imagination. Yeah, sure. Right? So you have Indonesia, for example. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, no. no. Yeah. So I think there's something more that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and, and actually, this is actually why I'm, I'm thinking about this, because we, you know, we've, we've, so trying to think about the Western Indian Ocean archipelagos, and, you know, it doesn't, so you, yeah, right. they don't produce the same thing, so how, how far, right, right, does the condition of, of an archipelago uh, enables, let's say, so. It has so. to be theorized. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it ha well, it has to be theorized. But let me, let me go through a number of very quick things. The first one is that the way in which colonialism was organized, um, it went to the metropole. So there were spokes to the metropole and not connections between each other. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And then to separate metropoles. So, so you know, there's Madrid uh, or, or, and, and there's Paris or, or, and there's London. Um, in fact, you know, Paris, France, as usual, the most centralized. Um, you want, you, Martinique is here. Guadeloupe is, uh, sorry, Dominica is in between, then there's Guadeloupe, right? Martinique and Guadeloupe are French. You want to send a letter from Martinique to Guadeloupe. It goes to Paris. It's cleared in Paris and goes back to Guadeloupe. On a good day, if you go on one of the mountains in Martinique, you can see Guadeloupe. <laughs> right? So that's, that's the nature of colonialism because, of course, there's divide and rule, there's wanting to control from the center and all these sorts of, sorts of things. So your English neighbors are not even on, on, the, on, the, on the charts. Um, Lamming, George Lamming in The Pleasures of Exile, which I've now mentioned three times, so put it on your reading list, <laughs> um, um, says the first time he discovered he was a West Indian is walking on the streets of London and meeting Barbadians. I mean, he's Barbadian, meeting Jamaicans and Trinidadians and discovering that he has so much more in common with them than with anybody else. Um, and the, there's, there's this notion that West Indian nationalism was born in England mm -hmm. and not in the Caribbean, where we had all of these things in common, but we just didn't know, right? Um, so so there's, a, there's this question of imagination and uh, you know, and uh, if you think about Benedict Anderson and the making of a national imaginary as well, you might want to bring that into the fold. But uh, having said that, um, there is this commonality of living and being and history that sits heavily upon the Caribbean people, right? Um, and there has been some significant movement. Uh, Actually, the two most Car genuinely Caribbean islands in terms of movement are Cuba and Trinidad. Right? Cuba in the early 20th century was uh, its its sugar was booming and it didn't have the people and it imported the people from the Caribbean, thus the cricket bar. Um, Trinidad was oil and the people came from Barbados and Grenada and um, elsewhere. Um, so these are really the, the, the islands in which. Um, particularly in southern Cuba, which is very different from Havana and North Cuba. These are islands where people know intimately um, what the Caribbean is. But Jamaicans, um, despite the fact that it was a Jamaican who kicked off the Haitian Revolution, Bootman, right? Jamaicans um, are like an Anglo-Jamaican sphere in a, in a Latin sea. Um, not, you know, Cuba is north of them, Haiti is to the east, um, um, Central America, Mexico, and to the far west. Um, and so therefore, there, there's a sense of, of more being by, you know, sui generis hmm. in, in Jamaica. But having said all of that, the world has shifted. And, you know, you have these vast diasporas in Brooklyn, for example, or in um, Toronto, or in Mad the wider Day County. Um, Broward County, um, which are which are just um, mingling masses of Haitians and Jamaicans and Trinidadians. I went to a part uh, a Trinidadian Independence Party in um, Broward, um, Pembroke Pines in Broward County, which is Fort Lauderdale to the mm -hmm. north of Miami. And um, they, there was a flag, big composite flag, on the behind the DJ 
of all the Caribbean nations, right? Including Cuba, including Suriname, including, and so this big composite flag, which was, uh, you know, sort of em emblematic of what is happening in, in, in these areas. So what does that mean for the future of the Caribbean? It certainly means that the diaspora is not operating, uh, it, even though it does have its own Jamaica and so on. And there's a big issue with, with Indo-Caribbeans in the diaspora, because many Indo-Caribbeans left Guyana in particular because of their problems with, with the Burnham regime, which was a, which was a repressive Afro-Guyanese um, regime. And so they, they, they stick to themselves and don't want to have anything to do with these people, which is the reason they left in the first place. So there, there's, there are these dimensions to it. But on the whole, um, that isn't the, the dominant trend in integration in the diaspora. So the diaspora then feeds back into um, this notion mm -hmm. of a Caribbean entity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just put those on. So, 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 so there's not a natural sort of archipelagic yeah. thing. In which we, we all know each other, and we all know who we are, and we're all as one. But it's, it's a creative process as well as a, a moving dynamic process. Yeah. Yeah, and if you think about the other kind of archipelago, Balago, that uh, the ideas of uh, decolonizing nations, non-aligned movement, Afro-Asian solidarity, so what unites uh, Tanzania, uh, Ghana, India, Yugoslavia, Indonesia, right? I mean, they're not even contiguous spaces, but there is the imagination of an archipelago of affinity, and in that sense, here too, is a notion of an affinity uh, brings it together, of course, aided by the fact that you're all derived from a similar history. Exactly. So you yeah, ju just to return to the question about different categories and characteristics of Caribbean thought, could you just maybe sketch out how someone like uh, Stuart Hall seems so different to someone like Sylvia Winter epistemically? Mm -hmm. Like, it seems like they're trying to achieve completely different right. ends and unsettle completely different things in different ways. Just yeah. to like, yeah, help me understand. Uh, well, that's a big question, right? right. Which, is trying, which, I, which was the googly, right? Or the Chinaman. I don't know which one that is. The backhand, coming out of the backhand. But yes, thanks for the question, nonetheless. Um, um, one of the features of Stuart that he has been most criticized for by a variety of his critics is his eclecticism is the fact that Stuart, you can't tie down Stuart to a single school of thought. Um, Stuart uses Gramsci, but, but, but he takes Gramsci and he uses him in ways which um, you know, are, are peculiar to him. Um, he incorporates um, uh, you know, various postmodern streams, but he gives them a twist. Um, he, he doesn't spend a long time writing a theoretical tome. Like if when he start, I mean, if you, 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 you'll have to gather together from various bits and pieces of chapters here and there what he says about Gramsci as opposed to a 400-page sustained critique of Gramsci, um, which, which you know, s some other scholars would want to do. Uh, because Stuart's concern is essentially in understanding a political moment or a series of political, more contiguous political moments in which these are the, the tools which, uh, which help you to understand it. You need, a, you need to change um, a tire, and you look in your toolkit and you discover you don't have a wrench, you will have to find something that can work, right? And so you, you dig around in a garbage pan and you find something that, that, that fits and you tie a, a piece of string onto it and you use it and you pull the, the, the logs. You make a log tool, right? Um, I hope Stuart up there isn't turning in his um, <laughs> engraved when I say these things, um, because that, that, that makes it sound maybe a little too crude. But Stuart's concern is to understand a moment in order to change it. And he uses um, theory in that way. And in that, he is profoundly Caribbean in terms of the improvisation, in terms of the eclecticism, in terms of the willingness to try to understand the tool, but not 
in and of itself. This is a tool. It is made of steel. It has a, a knobby end that can be put on top of a log. No. He wants to say, this is a tool. Can it work on this, on this log? Yes, it can. Let's use it. Um, I think that's where I want to go with Stuart in particular. Um, and this is why, you know, people who delve into theory and believe in theory in itself uh, get headaches with Stuart Hall. Um, this question, and we will have them every time, I suspect. Um, uh, in relation to Sylvia Winter, Sylvia Winter, and I'm thinking aloud here, is not entirely divorced from this. Right? Sylvia Winter is, is a rare scholar who in the Caribbean pantheon, there are few people like her who first of all is situated in terms of her scholarly background to take on the, 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 the sweep of Western civilization. Maybe James, who, was, who by the way was a self-taught scholar and never went to university, maybe James um, would have that sweep, but, but, but Winter has both the training and the sweep to, 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 to make an attempt at reinventing the big picture. Does she succeed? You know, we can debate that, and the debates will go on for a long time, because her work is not yet even out there sufficiently to, for us. Her, 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 her book, Black Renaissance, is going to come out perhaps black metamorphosis. Sorry, yeah, that Renaissance. I mean, I think I told you Renaissance as well because my I'm living in the Atlantic somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Black metamorphosis is going to come out um, um, perhaps later this year. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's going to be well over 500 pages. It's, it's going to be a sustained critique of, of the Western episteme and a statement of her location within it and how she explains what is captured in um, sporadically or in, in, in less sustaining um, moments in her other work. So, so, so she's a very different, but, but the way in which she is willing to assemble theory and to incorporate or throw out what she dislikes with, with a degree of confidence that she can do this and get away with it is, I think, what marks her in the same camp as Stuart Hall. And here I'm saying this for the first time in this way. Um, but I think that that is what brings them together and actually brings them together with James, who is very different in many respects. You know, James actually says he believes in European civilization, right? Which Sylvia did have, uh, or does have, many objections with him on that point. And poor James alive, I, I think he would have evolved because he was nothing but uh, uh, a living, growing thinker. But, um, but they have many differences. If you read Stuart Hall's The Rest and the West, The West and the Rest, then you see a different kind of commonality with Sylvia in how he, he portrays the role of uh, Western quote unquote civilization, the episteme, which which gives him which puts him on more common ground. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one last question. Um, uh, sorry. Um, uh, just a quick comment. Uh, thank you so much about explaining uh, the, the Stuart Hall way of thinking, because I. Um, I noticed that within the context of the Global South, we have this problem somehow, sometimes, that either we have, like, a, as Jay would say, or a wing that would say, okay, tradition, 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 mm -hmm. and the other wing would say, no, no, European, European, European. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also sympt sympt uh, symptomatic if we are talking about the Global South or, or Southern thought, that we use um, what Stuart Hull did actually the theory that is there as a tool in order to get out what I want to say. Uh, I'm not using it in a religious way, uh, but this is I need this, 
and I, I throw away what, what I don't need. So thank you so much for that. Um, the other question, um, I, I'm, I'm hearing and reading a lot about the imagination and the Caribbean imaginary, the, uh, this imaginary, this imagination. I understand the academic term, but um, why? I mean, uh, why this term imaginary? Why this term imagination? I mean, you, you, you talked about the whole networking of, of the Caribbean entity, whether in the diaspora or in the geographic uh, space, right? Or even in the temporal space. So I, I don't see the, the necessity to, to, to use the term imagination or imaginary, because even if it has with its philosophical connotations, because it's already there, everything is already there. There is no imagination, there is no imaginary. And maybe I'm, I'm being a little bit narrow-minded, but it it's like gives me a little bit of allergic, you know, <laughs> colonial allergic or imperialist al allergy. <laughs> like, it's like empty spaces or imagination or imaginary. Um, I don't know what, you know, what, what's your take on that? It's just, I know it's very narrow-minded for me, but yeah. I, I'm not quite sure if I'm understanding you entirely, um, but if I am, um, the way I'm, I'm using imaginary is, is in a very utilitarian manner to think about this space. It, I, I'm thinking about this space because it interests me because I'm from there. And I, I'm trying to understand it. But uh, beyond that sort of obvious fact, it is an extraordinarily fascinating space because of, among other things, the list of people I just mentioned. <laughs> right? Um, and therefore, you want to know, you know, how can a big sound come from a little island? Which is the question that, you know, metaphorically is being asked. Um, and and in, in order to do that, then we need to begin to imagine um, this as a, you know, what are the factors that contribute? Um, what is the historical context? What is the contemporary context? Um, whether this is still uh, a, a, an engine which is functioning or it is functioning, it's functioning in a different way to do this work, and um, um, that's it. Um, you know, beyond that, um, I, I imagine imaginary, imaginary in another sense. We, we 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 can explore the imaginary work of Caribbean musicians, poets, and and see what work they do. Um, which is different than the formal intellectualizing of the Jameses and the Halls and so on. And, and whether that also represents something which is unique and special, and why it does. Um, and I think there's a space to do that as well, uh, which I, we have done today, you know. What makes Bob Marley Bob Marley? Um, what, makes, what makes him different? Uh, we could mention 10 other names which have that sort of impact. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I'm not up in the air with, um, um, you know, a general imaginary for the sake of imaginary, but an imaginary used to help me in, in answering these very specific questions. Yeah, because there are these material cultures, these historical connections, and there is the imaginary that runs through them. Yeah. So I, I suppose it's the multiple presence of all of this rather than one over the other. But I think we've uh, run and come to the end of our time. And thank you so much yeah. for engaging us in conversation for four hours. That's <laughs> uh, extraordinarily generous of you. But I'd like to uh, end with, uh, just to be naughty, that we still haven't resolved the question. But <laughs> so we'd like to call you back. Right? <laughs> to maybe in another six months to tell us why you think so at all as a Caribbean thinker, apart from the improvisational Thing. And one could always say Weber Church is to cricket, as uh, Stuart Hall is to Marxism, yes. and all of that is yes. in its place. Yes. But I'd like to end with a very interesting uh, reference to a very interesting essay. A.K. Ramanujan, who's a very famous Indian poet and translator, who taught in Chicago for the better part of his life, he wrote a brilliant essay which is available online called Is There an Indian Way of Thinking? And what he does in this essay is a very naughty, playful uh, survey through Indic philosophies and, uh, and a comparative exercise with uh, 
Western forms of thinking, and he says that, well, if you're trying to compare these two, probably Indian uh, thinking is more context sensitive, mm -hmm. perhaps, and Western thinking is more context free. So for example, there are these universal laws in uh, Western thinking. So what, uh, you know, what happens in this instance will be replicated in another instance. Whereas in Indian philosophy, the question would be, okay, what, who is the person in enunciating this? That would make a difference yeah. to the value of the uh, statement being made. Or if a statement is made, what is the context in within which that statement is made? So if a murder happens, was the person killed with the blade of the axe the, or the head of the axe? Would that make a difference? So those kinds of things. But obviously, he is not hugely invested in this argument because he's not invested in the idea of fundamental differences. So he ends the essay with a very beautiful uh, reference to a Buddhist parable. Right, where uh, the Buddha meets a man who's carrying a boat around on his back. And so the Buddha asks him, so why are you doing this? And the man says, you see, there was a huge flood and this boat saved my life. Right? So which is a reference again to the fact of contextual thinking. So the boat saved his life during a flood. During the drought, he didn't carry it around on his back. So even when we think about the ways in which we can't think about the global South or Caribbean thought, it's a category that we are using in the midst of this enterprise right, of trying to think from our spaces as against uh, the forms of thinking that have come to us from Europe and America, which are enshrined in our universities, enshrined in our pedagogy, enshrined in our minds. And so we use it pragmatically, much the way that Stuart Hall might use for Gramsci in his own way or other, uh, other thinkers. So I think that element is probably something that we can retain. You know, the fact that when we think about thinking from the global south, it's also a contextual historical question, that we are thinking with this towards a certain purpose at a point in history. And perhaps there is nothing more to it than that, or perhaps there is more. But when you come back again and tell us why Stuart Hall is a Caribbean thinker, we'll know <laughs> that. So we'll call you back again. Thank, Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. Enjoy that, actually. Oh, that's really, really yeah. Yeah. <laughs>